What's up guys, it's Derek. We're here in New York City. We just finished watching Unfair Dealing here at 56 Walker Street. Um, and I'm here with, introduce yourself please. David Weingarten from Toronto. And he is behind the film Unfair Dealing. It deals with Canadian false flag terror. Please uh, explain for the audience and everybody listening a little bit more about the film and how you got involved and, and what it tries to cover. Well, I, re I really got involved in doing the film because there's a void of... Uh, of independent media in Canada. We're a highly media concentrated society. So when an event like this happens, a terrorist event that's used to take away our civil liberties, to ramp up uh, defense spending, to ramp up uh, spending of uh, spying on your communications, digital communications, um, I thought there's a void here that needs to be filled. This, there's information about this case that the public needs to know. This isn't a cut and dry case. And uh, now years after the fact, I think that's clear that it wasn't the Toronto 18, it was the Toronto 11, and I would even argue it's less than that. The informant has declared that three of the 11 convicted are, uh, are innocent. Uh, background on the case, the Toronto 18 was Canada's post 9-11 uh, terrorism event, the milestone terrorism event after 9-11. And what it was, um, was for the most part a group of kids that went camping with an informant. Uh, pretty innocent, innocuous stuff. Uh, there was a core group of four or five who did have some intent that they wanted to inflict damage on the country. The problem is that although they had the intent, there's two, there's two uh, parts to being found guilty of a crime, typically in Canada's criminal code. You need the guilty act and the guilty mind. So what the police have done is they've used all this money for, for uh, interception of emails and observing your digital communications. They found the people who had the intent, and what they did was they put in informants who gave them the means. And, you know, while it's a shame that these four or five people had the intent to inflict damage on the country, it's also the fact that it's the law enforcement and security agencies who give them the means then. And why do they give them the means? They do it because it's an opportunistic time when we want to increase defense spending, we want to increase security spending, we want to uh, support the war in Afghanistan, we want to sway public opinion so that the public will support the war in Afghanistan and, uh, and, and basically decrease our civil liberties. And so after doing your research and making this, this documentary, do you feel as if the Toronto 18, the Toronto 11, the Toronto 4 or 5, any of this would have gone on or got to the stage that we that we saw it go to without the help of the informants? No, absolutely not. I think that the, the core group, as they're called, the four or five who did have the intent, they started out talking about jihad on, on online forums and online websites. Um, uh, but it would have gone on for years that they would have continued talking. It was an informant that had actually introduced the idea of truck bombs and a fertilizer, and that informant's name is Kari Kifayatullah, who was reportedly after the arrest a volunteer for the UN in Afghanistan. Uh, he was actually so volatile, he was suggesting making bombs that another informant, Mubin Sheikh, had actually said to his handlers, you better take a look at this guy because he's mentioned in truck bombs. And his handlers have, uh, told him to back off because they knew he was an informant. But the ideas sort of are seeded by informants and then the actions and, and the ability to carry these ideas out are then furthered by informants. If there were no informants involved, we wouldn't know who these guys are. Exactly. And so we, you know, we appreciate you bringing the, this case to light. As you said, it, it helped pass some anti-terror legislation in Canada shortly after that, or it, it had already passed. Or how is it related to the, the anti-terror legislation that was going on in the country, and and where is it at now? Has have new measures been implemented? Well, the uh, the arrests came shortly before an extension to the war in Afghanistan. After the um, after the arrests, support for the war in Afghanistan went up. Uh, public opinion that Canada would be struck by a terrorist event increased, um, <clears throat> and it did come before a renewal of two very controversial aspects of Canada's uh, anti-terrorism laws, and that's um, uh, detention without charge and compelled testimony. Fortunately, when they expired at the end of 2006, Parliament did not vote to extend them. Fortunately, despite the convictions of, of these individuals and despite these arrests, so while we still have anti-terror laws, uh, fortunately those two very controversial clauses have been struck down. Unfortunately, the Harper majority government is still considering renewing them, reenacting them. For now, um, for now I'd, I'd say we're in a relatively good position considering where North America is right now. And so with the rest of the suspects, the ones who were released, have they tried in any way to get their story? Have you had any contact with them? I've had contact with several of them. 
Uh, but no, I, I don't get the impression that they are interested. I, one, one or two of them were interested for a while about suing the police, and, and rightfully so, to be put in solitary confinement in a small room for 14 months. That's psychological and physical torture, and uh, I think they're entitled absolutely to some sort of financial compensation that was mentioned by one of the family, uh, one of the suspects rather, in their families, Abdul Qayyum Jamal. He was originally uh, called the ringleader of the group because he was the oldest of the group. When he was released with the other seven, uh, he basically said, yeah, I'm owed millions, and, and I believe that he is. And so, uh, what is the wor the latest word on <clears throat> on those who are still locked up? Are they under uh, the uh, sol solitary confinement, or you know, do we have any word on the conditions of those who actually are still locked up? Well, as far as I know, the ones that have been convicted, no. The solitary confinement was when they were facing trial, and uh, it was twisted around to be for their protection kind of thing. Uh, now, as far as I know, they're in general population. Uh, of the convicted, I think the earliest that some of them will be eligible for parole maybe in the next year or two for, for some of the ones who were sentenced more minorly, uh, but some of them are facing quite a stretch in prison right now. We appreciate you bringing this story out here. Uh, let everybody know where they can find out more about the film. If, uh, if you'd like to see the movie Unfair Dealing, you can go to youtube.com slash unfair dealing. Uh, you can watch it on fortress-toronto.com, sorry, fortress-toronto.com, and, uh, and you can see it there as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.